Good morning and welcome once again to uh, Shekinah Grace Church. And this week, we want to look at where we left off last week. You know, as we have entered this new year, this new season, uh, we have declared it to be a year of God's rebuilding. And we are entering or we have entered into this series of where we call it the Supreme Revelation Jesus Christ, God's Son. The supreme revelation, Jesus Christ, God's Son. And, and, and last week, we looked at Jesus Christ is superior to Moses. And this week, we're going to look at Jesus Christ is superior to the prophets. And let's turn to scripture. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The word of God says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, had in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. My friends, this morning, I want you to understand that man has always felt an inner drive to live forever in a perfect world. Therefore, man has always sensed an inner need to search, an inner need to find out if there is a God. And if there is, they want to please him and to gain his approval and acceptance. This is where so much religion has come from, from the inner struggle of men to find God. And the tragedy is this. Men have groped and grasped after God as though they were in a dark world that gave no evidence of God. But this is not so. There is no need for men to be in the dark about God. Because God has revealed himself. He has revealed himself in many different ways. God has revealed himself through nature or what might be called a revelation of his supreme deity and power. A person can look at nature and clearly see God's deity and power. God has revealed himself through conscience, or what might be called an inner witness or sense of duty to God. God has revealed himself through law, or what might be called a revelation of supreme justice. God has revealed himself through religion, or what might be called a revelation of how to worship and to become acceptable to God. God has revealed himself through prophets and priests, or what might be called the revelation of God through human spokesmen and mediators. Now, the list could go on and on, but the point is that God has revealed himself to men. And each revelation has been very important for men's understanding of God. But despite all these revelations, something vital is still missing. If man is ever to know God, there is only one way. The very same way that man gets to know anybody. Man can know about a person know all the facts about a person's life, but until he personally meets that person, until he personally associates with that person and fellowships with the person, he does not personally know that person. Therefore, if a man was to ever know God, God has to reveal himself in the most supreme way possible. He had to come to earth and show himself to men. Revealing exactly who he is and what he is like. This is the whole point of these chapters. In fact, it's the point 
of the whole book of Hebrews. The supreme revelation of God is Jesus Christ, God's very own son. God has revealed himself in the most glorious way possible. He has sent his very own son into the world. Now in today's scripture reading, Hebrews chapter one, verses one to three, we see that men have usually looked upon the prophets of religion as great men of God. They have seen the prophets of God as very special servants of God. They, they have seen the prophets of God as men who had a special message from God. They have seen the prophets of God as men who could tell others how to become acceptable to God. They have seen the prophets of God as men who could tell others how to live and please God. This was a true concept. Just so the prophets was one of the chosen prophets of the Old Testament. You must understand the prophets of the Old Testament were great men of God. They were men to whom God spoke and to whom God entrusted his message. But as great as the prophets of the Old Testament were, they fade into insignificance when compared to Jesus Christ, God's very own son. Jesus Christ is far, far superior to the prophets. Let look, let's look at verses 1 to 2 of Hebrews chapter 1 again. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, had in this last day spoken unto us by his Son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. The first point I want to make is this. Jesus Christ is the supreme spokesman of God. This is the first reason why Jesus is superior to the prophets. Jesus Christ is the supreme spokesman of God. And I want you to note the glorious truth. God has spoken to men. He is not as most people think. Most people think that God is far off in the distance some place in the outer space, so far away that he is unconcerned with what is happening to man and his world. The very opposite is true. God is concerned with our lives. He is concerned with the trials and trouble. He is concerned with sin and evil. He is con concerned with, with our suffering and disease. He is concerned with death and decay. He is concerned with all that happens to us. Therefore, God has spoken to us. He has given us the wonderful words of life. He has given us the wonderful words of deliverance. He has told us how to conquer the trials and temptations, the corruption and death of this world. Now, what did God exactly speak to men? And where can we find the record of God's word? If God is really not far off in the distance someplace. If God has really spoken to men, then we must find his word and heed it. For his word would mean everlasting life. His word will mean victory over all the evil and trials, victory over corruption and death of this life. So where is God's word? It is found in two places. Firstly, God's word is found in the prophets. Now, in the ancient times, God spoke to men by his prophets. That is, by persons whom he had chosen to proclaim his word to the world. And who are these persons? They are the men and women of the Old Testament scriptures. But note a significant fact. God spoke through the prophets. That scripture tells us at sundry times, that means, or that is, in many parts, in many separate revelations, at many different times. And then again, the phrase, in many ways. What does this mean? No man could possibly receive and understand or explain the whole revelation of God. God and the truth of God is too big for any one man. Therefore, God had to make many revelations 
to many different people. He had to use many different ways to speak to men. No man could ever contain, no man could ever share the whole revelation of God. There had to be a gradual opening of man's mind concerning the Messiah, concerning the Savior of the world. And scripture progressively reveals this to us. In Genesis 3, 15, God spoke to Adam and God told Adam that the Savior would come from the seed of the woman. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, chapter 18, verse 18, and chapter 22, verse 18, God spoke to Abraham and told Abraham that the Savior would come from his seed. In Genesis 49, verse 10, God spoke to Jacob and told him that the Savior would come through the tribe of Judah. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13, God spoke to David and told David that the Savior would be born of his house. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, God spoke to Micah and told him that the Savior would be born at Bethlehem. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, God spoke to Isaiah and told him that the Savior would be born of a virgin. I want you to also note the different ways in which God spoke to the prophets. In Exodus 19, verse 19, and Deuteronomy 5, verse 22, God spoke to Moses in a great thundering voice in the midst of a storm. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 12, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 12, God spoke to Elijah by a still small voice. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1, God spoke to Isaiah in a vision. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 5, God spoke to Samuel in a dream. On and on the list could go, for God spoke to his prophets in many different ways. But the point to see is this. Each prophet could present only a part of God's revelation. No one of them could present the whole revelation of God. For the full revelation of God is not found in the prophets. Where is it found then? This brings us to the second point. The second point is this. God's word, his full revelation is found in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. This is the most astounding truth imaginable. For God could send no greater messenger with his word than to send his very own son. And this is the astounding declaration of this passage. God has sent us his son to proclaim his word to men. Before Christ, no man could fully grasp or understand God. No man could fully proclaim the word of God. Man could understand only a part or a fragment of God. But now God's very own son has come to earth, has revealed God, proclaiming all that God is. And my friends, I want you to note this morning, it is he himself who is the revelation of God. He embodies the word of God. He is the word of God. Everything that God has ever wanted to say to men is said in the person, Jesus Christ. He is the perfect expression of God's mind. Everything that man needs to know about God and the conquest of life and its trials and corruption and death is seen in Jesus Christ. This means several wonderful things for us today, my friends. This means several wonderful things. No matter your circumstances, don't look at your circumstances and your surroundings, but look towards God. Because the first fact is this, God loves man. He has not left man in the dark, groping and grasping and trying to find the truth of life, trying to find the truth and death and, and, and hereafter. God has spoken to man. God has revealed the truth. He has revealed the truth about where we have come from. He has revealed the truth about why we are here. Where are we going? He has revealed the truth about how we can conquer the trials, the evil, and death of this life and world. The second thing that I want to 
to, 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 I want you to think about this, this. If we want to know the truth about God ourselves, we have to look into God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know the truth about God, if you want to know the truth about yourself, you have to look to God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's He and He alone is the full revelation of God. Thirdly, Jesus Christ is superior to all prophets. All prophets. He alone is the supreme revelation of God. As great as the Old Testament prophets were, they were not above God's Son. The Lord Jesus Christ is above the prophets. He is the supreme, the full and final spokesman for God. There can be no greater spokesman than that of God's own son. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. Had in this last day spoken unto us by his son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Jesus Christ is appointed the heir of all things. This is the second reason why he is superior to the prophets. What is meant by heir? It means that Jesus Christ is to receive and be the lawful owner of all things. That's what the Amplified New Testament tells us. Jesus Christ alone has inherited all that God is and all that God has. No man is great enough or worthy enough to be the heir of God. Only Christ is. He alone has lived. He alone has walked perfectly before God. Among men, he alone has obeyed God perfectly. Therefore, he alone has inherited all that God is and all that God has. He alone has been appointed to be the owner of all things. And what is it that Jesus Christ is to inherit and receive? And for this, I'm going to turn to a few scriptures. Firstly, Jesus Christ is to inherit all power in heaven and earth. In Matthew 28, verse 18 says, And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Secondly, Jesus Christ has inherited the authority to execute all judgment upon men. In John 5, verse 22, the word of God tells us, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Thirdly, Jesus Christ is going to inherit the Lordship over both the dead and the living. Romans 14, verse 9. Romans 14, verse 9 says this, For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. Jesus Christ is going to inherit the whole universe, a new heavens and earth, and a new world capital. Jesus Christ is going to inherit all governments, an eternal government. Jesus Christ is going to inherit all power and riches, wisdom and strength, honor and glory, and blessing. You know, Revelation 5 verse 12 says this, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Jesus Christ is going to inherit all the angels and all the spiritual authorities and power. 1 Peter 3 verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 22 says, who is gone into heaven as he's on, and he's on the right hand of God. Angels and authority and powers been made subject unto him. And finally, Jesus Christ is going to inherit a name above every name. Every knee shall be bowed before him, vindicating his claim to be both Lord and Savior. Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 to 10. Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 to 10. Scripture says, Wherefore God also had highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at that the name Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Let's go back to that scripture again. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. This is what it says. 
had in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Jesus Christ is the creator and maker of the worlds, all of the worlds. This is the third reason why Jesus Christ is superior to the prophets. The word worlds in the Greek can also be translated as ages. Jesus Christ is the creator of both the universe and the ages that roll in one upon another. He is the creator of both the worlds and time as it moves forward from event to event and generation to generation. You know, the Amplified New Testament states it well. Hebrews 1 verse 2, this is what it says. He, Christ, created the worlds and the reaches of space and the ages of time. That is, he made, produced, built, operated, and arranged them in order. Colossians states it even better. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 says this. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. The point is this, my friends, the creation of Christ includes all the worlds. Now this word worlds is in the plural of all the dimensions of being, wherever they are, and however many they may be, this is exactly what is meant by the plural worlds. It's also, it is also what is meant by when, when Colossians say that Christ created all things that are in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dimensions or principalities or powers. If there are other visible planets, and living beings in outer space. Christ created them. You must understand this today, my friends. If there are invisible worlds and beings in other dimensions, Christ created them. It does not matter what kind of world or creatures they may be, thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, Christ created them all. There is nothing in existence that he has not created. No planet, no vegetation, no star, no mineral, no creature, no element, no dimension, no thing. Nothing created without him. All things in John chapter 1 verse 3. John chapter 1 verse 3 says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Thank you, Lord. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says this, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus Christ possesses the very glory of God. This is the fourth reason why Jesus Christ is superior to the prophets. I want you to note the word being in that scripture. It means absolute and timeless existence. This means that Jesus Christ himself possessed the glory of God before he ever came into the world. He has always existed in the glory of God. He is eternal. Now, what does glory mean? My friends, this morning, I want you to take note that glory means all the brightness of God, all the brilliance, all the radiance, all the splendor, all the light of God's being. It means God's very presence in all of his light, in all of his purity, dwelling among us in the person of Jesus Christ. It meant that in Christ dwelt all the fullness of glory of God. Man could look at Jesus Christ and see the glory of God in him, the very light, the very radiance of God's being. 
Let me give you a scripture's reference. John chapter 1 verse 14. John chapter 1 verse 14. Scripture says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as, the, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, my friends, many commentators point out that the sun is a good illustration. Just as the glory of the sun's light reaches down to earth and touches the lives of men, so Jesus Christ, who is the glory of God, reaches down and touches the life of men. Then the second point that I want to make is this. Jesus Christ is the express image of God. This is the fifth reason why Jesus Christ is superior to the prophets. The word express means the very stamp, the mark, the impression, the very reproduction of God. Jesus Christ is the perfect imprint, the very, the, the, the very image of God's nature. And the word image means substance. Jesus Christ is the very substance, the very being, the very person, the embodiment of God. Remember in John chapter 10, verse 30. John chapter 10, verse 30. This is what scripture says, or this is what Jesus said. I and my father are one. The next point. Jesus Christ is the sustainer of the universe. And this is the sixth reason why he's superior to the prophets. No man holds the universe together, but Christ does. God has not created the world or left it to fly through the space to take whatever course it will. God is not going to let the world destroy itself. I want you to remember this morning that God is in control. His son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is controlling the world and moving it forward to a climatic moment of renewal, to a climatic moment of recreation. What the Bible calls the great day of redemption. And I want you to note how he's holding it together. He's holding it together by the power of his word. He simply speaks and the laws that hold the world together are set in motion. The word of Jesus Christ is perfect and pure energy. The word of Jesus Christ is perfect and pure force. The word of Jesus Christ is perfect and pure power. The word of Jesus Christ is perfect and pure order. The word of Jesus Christ is perfect and pure unity. The word of Jesus Christ is perfect and pure solidarity. The word of Jesus Christ is perfect and pure cohesion. It is his word that holds everything together. It is his love and power that keeps the universe from flying apart. It, it is his love and power that keeps evil from completely conquering and utterly destroying all things. Colossians chapter 1 verse 17. Colossians chapter 1 verse 17 says, And he is before all things. And by, all, by him, all things consist. The fourth part. Jesus Christ is the redeemer of mankind. Jesus Christ is the redeemer of mankind. This is the seventh reason why he's superior to the prophets. Redemption has not come from some great prophet who has made purification for our sins. Christ and Christ alone could sacrifice himself for our sins. And how could he do this? In fact, how could ma any man do this? My friends, no man can. This is the point of this passage. Only a perfect person could ever purify and cleanse men from their sin. This is the reason Jesus Christ had to come to earth and live a perfect life. He had to secure the perfect righteousness for men and die as the perfect substitute for men. And by, by doing so, he stands for all men. His perfect righteousness stands for all men. His sacrificial death stands for all men. That's why when a man believes in Jesus Christ, when he truly believes the righteousness and death of Jesus Christ 
cover him. God takes the man's faith and honors it. He honors it by counting the man as being in the righteousness and death of Jesus Christ. You and I are righteous in Christ, for we have already died to sin in Christ. Therefore, we are purified. Our sins are cleansed and washed away. Let me give you a scripture reference for that. 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. This is what it says. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The fifth point that I want to make regarding this verse, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. Jesus Christ is the supreme mediator and intercessor. And this is the eighth reason why he is superior to the prophets. He is sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, sitting there as the great mediator and intercessor for men. I want you to remember this. There is no other person who could ever come close to being seated at the right hand of God. No other person could ever be accepted by God as the mediator and intercessor for man. Christ and Christ alone can sit at the right hand of God. And I wanted to note two significant points. Firstly, Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God as the exalted Lord, as the sovereign majesty of the universe. He is the supreme being of the universe. The person who is to be supreme supremely respected and honored, worshipped and served by all beings in both earth and heaven. Philippians 2 verse 9 says this, Wherefore God also had highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And secondly, Jesus Christ is in the presence of God as our mediator and intercessor. As the only person who has the right to represent man before God. My friends, please take note. Christ is not exalted to stand as our prosecutor and judge. Contrarywise, he is before God to represent us. He is pleading for us. Offering his righteousness and sacrificial death for us. And this means a most wonderful thing. Someday when we appear before God, if we have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, God will be able to deal with us in love and not judgment. Because Jesus Christ stands before God as our mediator. God will accept all those who have trusted Christ to be their mediator. Remember, however, all those who have rejected Jesus Christ as the mediator shall face Jesus Christ as the sovereign Lord and judge. Let me give you a scripture reference. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. The word of God says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, that man Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Loving Father, we stand amazed at the wonder of who you are and that you should come to a place or you have shown your love, Lord, to each one of us to rescue us from the wages of our sin and convey this truth to us through your single integrated, supernaturally inspired message of scripture. May we study to be approved and not stand ashamed before your throne of grace. Heavenly Father, thank you for the message of salvation and grace to all that you sent through the Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, so that all who believe on his name will not be condemned but have everlasting life. Father, give us the strength and we will sing of your love forever. Loving God, we are filled with awe and wonder that you should love us and die for us. 
we are not worthy to gather the crumbs from underneath your table. But you have redeemed us from death and hell with your own precious blood. We are filled with awe and wonder and praise and thanks. For you alone are worthy. Father, may we, glori may we glorify your name forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friends, this week I pray that as we have entered a season of God, of, of the year where God is rebuilding, or season of God's rebuilding, I want us to understand who Jesus is and what a mighty God we serve and worship. And I pray that all God's plans and purpose for you will be fulfilled as you allow this rebuilding to take place in your life. As you allow Jesus Christ to start working in your life. I wish you all a happy week ahead. For those online, we'll see you on next week. Thank you for joining us. And for those in our household, please hold on for a while. God bless you all.